Hi, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth coming at you from my closet in North Carolina. Hey, this is Christy in my closet, actually in my closet in St. Louis. <laughs> She's back home. Yes. Back in the mothership. Yeah, it was a good, uh, good little break to get away for a week, but I bet always good to come home. Yeah, it is. And for sure, appreciate say. my bed way more. Than <laughs> yeah, like, guys, she complained about her vacation bed. <laughs> uh, we, I literally jumped in it just to see what it would feel like, and it felt like you're just jumping on a rock. It was awful, awful. Ooh, and it was a really nice place too. I know, like, like nice, but not the bed. <laughs> maybe they should not spend their money on the iPad lights and <laughs> buy a good mattress. The hub. The hub. Yeah, the hub. <laughs> I got a virtual tour. It was really cute. Yeah, it was fun. fun little house. Yeah, what's going on with you? Oh, not a whole lot, you know. Um, probably wanting to hide in my closet a little bit more these days. I feel ya. Really. A uh, sad week. Yes. It's been a sad week and our hearts here in our closets are going out to all those victims, families, for all these racial injustices that have been going on and we could do an entire podcast on it, but yep. Clearly we won't right now, but it's very emotional and we need to, we do need to have conversation about it. So maybe there is something that we can do at some point to bring light to all of this. Oh yeah. Yeah. We definitely feel the city of Minneapolis and George Floyd's family. And I mean, like what is up with 2020? For real. <laughs> Well, things are just really coming to the surface, I think, in 2020, and I'm I'm heartbroken, but I'm very glad to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, and, and it needs to be talked about. Don't be afraid, people, to talk about it. Talk about it with your friends. Talk about it with your family. Everybody needs to talk about it over cocktails, yeah. over coffee. Mm -hmm. You need to be open, and you need to want to try and figure out how to be a part of the change in any little or big way that you can. Yeah. Talk to your kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Talk to your they're... parents. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Shout it. I love it. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're good. My mom is here. Oh, yay. She, yeah, she shout out to my mother. She came down on Friday and is spending a couple weeks with us. And so I can go running whenever I want. <laughs> and you know, it's been nice. It's been super nice. Fun. Well, I hope you enjoy the time with her. Yeah, we will for sure. She wants to come in and see my setup in the closet whenever we're all done. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> <laughs> she thinks we're something. Yeah, we fancy. <laughs> She's our biggest fan, so. But uh you want to talk about a murder? Uh faux show. Okay, I got a murder for you today. We are going to be talking about the murder of Helly Crafts. Have you heard of this? No. No. Oh, really? Okay, this is a big one. This is a real big murder. And um, so this murder is actually featured, oh, well, it's inspired the, a scene in the movie Fargo. I'm not oh, going to tell you what you scene. This. You mentioned this, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you what scene because I don't want to give away the goods of the murder. But yeah, it's crazy. So when you finish this episode, go look up the scene. I'll tell you what it is at the end. So, Okay. Let me tell you about Helly Crafts. Helly was born Helly Lork Nielsen, and she was born in Denmark. So she oh. is a little Danish lady, and she was born in 1947. Okay, this is an older case, which makes it super cool, actually. Um, Helly was blonde, 
she was very lovely. She was extremely poised. She was very smart. She spoke five languages. Whoa. Yeah. <clears throat> three fluently. And then two, um, she could, she could navigate her way. She was very well traveled. She was, grew up in a good family. She was very loved. She has a lot of friends, like just a sweet, sweet little blonde Danish girl. In 1967, Helly got a job as a flight attendant. So this is when she was 20 years old and this is in the sixties. Okay. So like, I just picture her as being like, do you remember how they wore like the flight? They were called stewardesses back then. And mm -hmm. they wore like, um, the like mid thigh length one suit, you know, yeah, uniforms I, with like the little scarves. And when you said that, I thought of, isn't it? If catch me if you can. Yes. Maybe like I thought of like that this the scene in that movie because I feel like they yeah, were with the like pillbox hats and yeah. you know like so cute, right? Okay, so she was totally that. She was really really pretty and blonde and um this twenty year old flight attendant who was super super cute. And in 1969, she met a pilot named Richard Crafts. They met in Florida during a training session or a training like seminar that they were all doing. And they met by the pool, which is just like so 60s. I love it. And Richard was 10 years older than she was. And I mean, he was not that cute. Like he, ha he looked like this typical, like he had the sad swipe hair and the <laughs> glasses and like the mustache. And like, I don't know. I just picture him as being this like 60s, 70s guy that wore like the socks, the tube socks with the stripes at the top and like drove his <laughs> like wood paneled station wagon or whatever. I mean, he didn't, but like, that's what he looks like. Okay. Okay. So she fell in love with this man like in love and her friends even were like i mean she's this gorgeous 22 year old girl and her friends were like we we don't really get it but like he was a pilot and so that's you know and he's older than her and he makes good money and like you know it just she found it really appealing and she just her plunked mm -hmm. right in the pool of love so richard actually grew up in connecticut his father was a pilot for the military and he actually went on to work for the Marine Corps and was a helicopter pilot for them before becoming a commercial pilot and then them meeting. Okay, so he's 10 years older. He's a pilot. They work for different airlines, but they begin this relationship. Okay, so really quickly into the relationship, it became really weird, like a weird relationship. And Richard was super unfaithful to her and would sleep around when he would go on his trips and was mean to her. Like when she would confront him about it, he was just not very nice and was like verbally abusive to her. And her friends were like, girl, what are you doing? Like, get out. I mean, he suffered, he said he suffered from PTSD from being in the Marine Corps and was he was volatile. Like they had a really volatile relationship and she loved him. Just, she stuck by him every time. Like, mm -hmm. like she loved him. The typical, like he won her over, but then his true colors came out afterwards. And she's, you know, that woman that I love him though. And yeah, probably apologizes after he does it. And mm -hmm. yeah, it'll yeah. get better. Yeah, I mean, it's just their relationship is described as like when it was good, it was really, really good. Mm -hmm. But when it was bad, it was unbearable. So from her friend's perspectives. So and he even said to her, like, she's completely in love with him. Please stop seeing these other women. Please pick me. Be faithful to me. And he's like, well, if you get pregnant, I'll marry you. But that's like the only way I'm going to marry you. What? Like, like it is no... um coincidence that the nickname for Richard is Dick. <laughs> okay. Because like he for sure was a mm -hmm. big one. So she got pregnant. Huh. So I don't, I mean, you know, is it on purpose? Is it not on purpose? Cause she wants to get married, you know, and there's an issue there cause you don't want to be trapping your man, but 
She does get pregnant. He got angry and beat the crap out of her. What? So she got an abortion. Oh, gosh. This is in the 70s. Okay. So then a couple a year or so later, she gets pregnant again. And when she got pregnant this time, Richard leaves her. He left. He leaves her. He doesn't talk to her for weeks at a time. And she schedules to have an abortion. But then he comes back and agrees to marry her. Oh, oh, he's living up to that promise that he made. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> what a, what a my guy. Stand up guy. guy, stand up guy. Yeah, so they were married in 1975, and they moved to a really, really beautiful home in Newtown, Connecticut. Hmm. And during the time that they lived in Newtown, Connecticut, they went on to have three beautiful children. Okay. So during this time that they lived and started their family, um, Heli was seemingly happy. I mean, she had what she wanted. She had her beautiful home. She had her successful husband. She continued to work as a flight attendant. So as you can imagine, they both were like crossing in the air. I mean, he was a pilot and she was a flight attendant and they traveled all the time. So they relied a lot on nannies and babysitters to help with their kids between the two of them. So this is in the 1970s, but they made over $120,000 a year. And at that time, it put them in the top 5%. That was that's really a lot good money. money. That's a lot of money. That's right. So they had the perfect life as far as Heli was concerned. It was what she wanted. It was what she signed up for. However, nothing changed with Richard. Mm-hmm. He kept an apartment for himself as like a bachelor pad in New York City And would continue to have his affairs and his flings and, you know, whatever else he did. Did Heli know about that apartment? Mm, Or you don't know that? Yes. We think that she did particularly later on. I mean, I don't think it was something they talked about. Mm -hmm. But she was not a stupid lady. She Mm -hmm. just, I don't know what, she was insecure. She was blind to... She didn't want to see, she did not want to accept Mm -hmm. what was really happening in her life. She was an abused woman. I mean, he continued to be volatile and I mean, she had even suspected that he was having some affairs with some of her flight attendant friends, which is so hurtful. I mean, she's got children. She's, this is a small community, especially back in the seventies of these people that worked in, you know, for airlines and things like that. Like that's, it's, it's embarrassing. It's devastating. She kept very quiet about all of it, but like her close friends, they knew, you know, um, they were never together. They never did anything together. It was kind of like, she did all the things with the kids. She did all the things for the house and, you know, whatever. And when he showed up, it was expected to be like, Oh, great. Daddy's here. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just like a, a special little treat. She was under a spell. Nobody got it. So during this time that he was a pilot and that they were living in Connecticut, he also was a part-time police officer. Okay. I don't really, what? I don't really get how you can be a part-time police officer, but like the seventies were the seventies. So, okay. So in 1984, Richard was diagnosed with colon cancer and he was given a less than 5% chance of survival. And this kind of brought them back together, bonded them because she really stuck with him through his treatment and all that stuff. And he beat the odds. Yeah. Wow. Yay. So in the summer of 1986, Miss Helly found some paperwork from, uh, that Richard had bought a car for another flight attendant that she knew. So she, yeah. (laughs) Sorry guys, you can't see my face, but I'm like, what? (laughs) Yeah. So she finds this paperwork that he's paid for a car for this woman that she is kind of friends with and is paying the insurance on the car as well. And she tells him she is done. She wants a divorce. So at this point they were right. So this is summer of 86. They'd been married 12 years by this point. They had, their kids were eight, 10 and 12. Okay. So Richard, the dick, (laughs) <laughs> pulls out the cancer card and is like, my cancer's back. Oh, you, but it was so sorry. I, you can't do this to me. No, it wasn't. It wasn't back. 
he's like, you can't do this to me. I want to be with you. I want to be with my family. I think that I'm dying. And she's like, you know what? I'm not going to stay married to you, but you can stay here. You can stay in the house until the divorce is final. Right. So she's like, right. Which is real big of her because she does have these three kids and they have been married for 12 years. And, you know, so she's like, you can stay. However, at the same time, she meets with an attorney and is like, I want a divorce. I'm done. She fi- I'm filing for divorce. But she does express concern to her attorney that he is not going to take this divorce well and is going to be angry and possibly even violent towards her. And she even tells her attorney, if something happens to me, don't think it was an accident. Oh my gosh. I hate when people say that. (laughs) It should make whoever they're saying it to automatically be like, let's get you out and like safe somewhere else. Not, oh, okay. Sweet. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So we're going to take a break and I'm going to tell you what happens and what she does do right after this. Okay. So Miss Helly is all done. She files for divorce. She's super scared of her husband at this point and vocalizes this to her attorney. Upon her attorney's suggestion with the child custody issues and things that are going on, she says, you should hire a a private investigator and see what this guy is really doing. Let's see about this cancer. Okay. Okay. Is he going to appointments that you aren't aware of? That's right. That's right. So in the fall of 1986, a couple months after she tells him she wants a divorce, she hires this man named Keith Mayo, who is a private investigator and works really closely closely with him and finds out that he does not, in fact, have cancer, that he is not going to appointments. He's working and he is continuing to have affairs specifically with that one that he bought the car for who Helly knew and was friends with. So she's like bye boy. Mm -hmm. I'm all done. You're gone. Leave my house. Get away from me and my children. We're done. Okay. So that brings us to (laughs) November 18th, 1986. Helly is coming home from a European trip. So she comes home from the airport. She lands. She's been gone for a few days and her friend drops her off at home sometime around dinner time, 6.30, 7 o'clock. Her nanny was there working, you know, with the children. She had the night off that night. So when Helly got there, the nanny gets ready and she goes out. And she doesn't come home until like 2 in the morning, right? So she went out. She had a date with her boyfriend, whatever. Went out with She's friends. A live-in, a live-in nanny. Then. She's yeah. a live-in nanny. Okay. She's like an au pair. Yeah. Okay. So the next morning, everyone wakes up and it had snowed. There was, you know, lots of snow on the ground and the electricity in the house had gone out. So Richard grabs the kids, grabs the nanny, and in kind of a flurry is like, get in the car. We're going to my sister's house. I'm taking you guys to my sister's house while we figure out what's going on with the power. Helly was not there. Okay. So her car was gone as well. And so the nanny and the kids just assume like, okay, she's gone somewhere. She'll meet us at the sister's house. So the next day, November 19th, Helly was a no call, no show for work, Oh, which is super unlike her, right? Never a good sign either. Never a good sign. So her work and her friends called Richard and said, he said, well, you know, it's coming up close to Thanksgiving. And she decided that she wanted to go to Denmark to be with her sister, to see her family. And just not tell anyone. Yeah. She just didn't tell anyone. She decided to take a last minute trip. Well, I mean, they knew that things were super rough with their marriage. And so like the fact that she would want to get away was not crazy, Mm. but she didn't call into work. Right. I mean, it's very suspicious, right? So Thanksgiving comes comes and goes. Weeks go by. Nobody can reach her. There is no sign of her anywhere. So finally, on December 1st, her friends report her missing. Oh, not okay. Richard. Not. 
Mm -mm, not dick. So they call, her friends also call her attorney. And her attorney calls Keith and they really push the police to look into this. They're like, look, I don't care what he says. Mm -hmm. She's gone. Something is going on. And remember, Richard is police too. Uh. He's a part-time police officer as well. So, um, you know, they, but they tell her, they tell the attorney or the police about her fear. They, the attorney tells the police what Richard has been doing about his violent behavior and his affairs and these things that Helly has uncovered in the last couple of weeks with the private investigator. The police talk to the private investigator. So they finally decide to look into her as a disappearance and they call Richard up and they bring him in and they give him a lie detector test. She completely denies knowing where Helly is. He passes the test. Passes the lie detector test. Okay. Not surprising since he's just a pathological liar in general. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He feels pretty good about it. Mm -hmm. So they also brought in, they search their house and they bring in a forensic expert to search their home. And the forensic, so you have to remember, this is in the 80s. Right. So like forensically, we're talking about a whole different world. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, this is 35 years ago that this happened. You know what I mean? So like forensically, things were super, super different. So I do want you to keep that in mind as I go through like what happens. Um, he, the forensic expert finds blood droplets on their mattress. That is consistent with a blow to the head, to somewhere, a blow to somewhere. So it's not like she cut herself and got, you know, blood on the mattress. Um, it's, it's droplets. It's really like a specific pattern. And there's also like a smear. It's like a six inch smear on the side of the mattress. So they test this blood and they do find that it is a match for Heli's blood type. So they did not have DNA testing at this time, but the blood type was O positive, which is the same as Heli's. Okay. They also find that the bathroom towels that Richard is still using were at some point soaked in blood. So not just droplets, they had a lot of blood on them, right? right. So now they, they announce that Richard is a suspect, right? In the disappearance of his wife. So they interview the nanny. She last reports that she saw her on the evening of the 18th when her friend dropped her off and that she did never see her again or hear from her again after that. She does say that the carpet in the bedroom had recently been replaced and that they had bought a couple weeks before all of this had gone down a freezer that was put in the garage that was now missing. Oh. So, you know, she talks about that, that Richard did have some strange behavior the morning of the 19th when he shooed him out, that they were there at his sister's house all day long, which you know, with him not calling and just being like, no, you got to stay longer. You got to stay longer. You know, the power's out, whatever. Um, the police called the Denmark family. There's no sign of her. They have not seen her. She did not have a trip planned there. She did not come there. So like she's gone. She is missing and something shady is really going on. So they retra retrace Richard's steps and they find that on November 10th, so this is eight days before Heli goes missing that he bought a drunk dump truck that he says is for gravel. And he bought had a kitchen a dump truck. He bought a dump truck. <laughs> like, I'm telling you. I know, right? Like, I guess he didn't want to rent one and give it back. But so then on November 13th, he drove 30 minutes away from where he lived and bought a freezer, a shovel and some gloves. So it's relevant that he drove 30 minutes away because there were multiple places within like four miles of where he lived, where these things could have been bought. So he drove out a ways. Uh, and bought very suspicious items. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a freezer, which the nanny said, we recently got a new freezer a week or so before all this, you know, she disappeared. And now it's gone. Okay, so then on November 14th, they found credit card receipts that he had reserved an industrial size wood chipper. Oh, stop. 
I know. Oh, okay. No. Okay. This was a big wood chipper. Like, this is not a wood chipper. Like, even, I mean, we have a farm and we have to, like, get rid of trees and leaves. This wood chipper that he rented is, like, three times the size that even we would need. Oh, my gosh. It is, like, an industrial-sized piece of machinery here. Okay. So, this is what they know, but they have no body, no weapon, no witnesses, and no heli. So during all of this time that they're looking into Richard and investigating all of this stuff, he is just continuing to work, continuing to go on his trips, continuing to see his girlfriends. Mm, no concern. And have really. his life. Yeah. But community starts to get wind of all of this stuff that's going on, right? And a tip comes in. So remember, the night that she went missing during that those few days, there was a big snowstorm. So there's a tip that comes in from a snowplow driver who was out plow plowing the roads the morning of November 20th, mm. okay, at 3.30 in the morning. And he reports suspicious activity that he saw a man under a bridge down by the river running a wood chipper. Oh, no. Yeah. So the police go to this riverbank that he reports that he saw this man. And they do find big chunks of wood on the riverbank. And they search and they search and they found an envelope that was partially destroyed, but not completely, but it had Helly's name on it. So it was like a piece of mail that had her name on it. So they're like, well, that's real coincidental, right? They're starting to put these pieces together. They spend days and days searching this riverbank and end up finding over 2,000 blonde human hairs. They find blue fibers. They find bone fragments, a fingernail with pink nail polish on it, and a tooth, and then also a crown on this riverbank. Oh my gosh. Okay. You think... And well, just, that this would be the perfect way to get rid of somebody <laughs> to put them through a wood chipper. But yes, enter Fargo. Okay, so they then search the river, the river, and they wait. They send dive teams in, and they go in and they search the river bed, and they found a chainsaw that had human hairs and tissue, human tissue embedded in the chainsaw but the serial number of the chainsaw is scratched off oh okay so okay i feel like we can all clearly see what happened here and what has been going on with sir richard but there's no dna this is back in the 80s so like and there's no body so their work is super, super cut out for them. And I watched a Forensic Files on this episode where they talk about all the forensic work that they did. And it is phenomenal. It was so much fun to watch how they pieced this together to stand up in court. Hmm. Amazing forensic work. Okay. So they were able to match the hairs in the chainsaw and the hairs that they found on the riverbed to a hairbrush of Helly's, and were able to tell that it was her hair as close as they could get right the bones that they found they were able to ex extract blood type from the bones and were able to match that blood type to heli's blood type they were then able to this is crazy cool they took the fingernail got the fingernail polish off the fingernail and matched it to a bottle of fingernail polish in the craft's home whoa so they were isn't that cool and they were able to match the dental records of the tooth and the crown that they had found to Helly's dental records, which was the clincher, right? They then used a chemical on the chainsaw and were able to like eat away at the metal sort of and the way that it was scratched off and kind of found like the underlying indentations. 
and found recovered the serial number and matched the serial number to a warranty card that Richard Crafts had sent in. What? What? Okay, you scratched Crazy. the serial number off, but you still sent the warranty card in like you're going to claim that it stopped working and you're going to get another one or money back or something like that. Well, I think you sent the warranty card in like when you bought it. Oh, so, okay. So basically we're assuming that Previous. he bought this not to murder her. He just ended up using right. it. To, okay. Okay. Right. Yes. Because we don't have a record of him buying a the chainsaw close to the time of the murder. So gotcha. it could have been five years old for all we know. Right. Okay. So finally in January of 1987, this is a couple months after Heli disappeared, Richard was arrested and charged with the first degree murder of his 39 year old wife, Heli Crafts. And he pled not guilty. Okay. So the trial begins and this, again, it's a nobody case, right? So they can prove a lot of things. Mm -hmm. They have all of this stuff that, you know, Richard did, but there's no body. And I mean, any true crime fan knows that no body cases are not easy cases to prosecute because you can't even really prove that they're dead, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But they got a lot of evidence. So their story is that Heli came home around six o'clock the night of November 18th. The nanny left. She fed the kids. She put them to bed. Richard comes home. They're already in these huge arguments because she has kicked him out of the house. She has told him she wants a divorce. She's all done. We know he's violent. He hit her with something and killed her. He put her body in the freezer, cleaned everything up with towels as much as he could. Obviously, he couldn't clean the carpet because he had to replace the carpet later on. And after she had been in the freezer for about a day, he took her remains to the riverbank, used a chainsaw to cut every cut up her body, and then fed it through the wood chipper, thinking that all of her remains would be shot into the river. And there would be no evidence. And remember, she was frozen. So there was no blood. Oh. Yeah. I didn't think about that. Yeah. So all of you would think it would be this big bloody mess, but she was frozen. So he's really thinking that like these big chunks of her are just going to go in the river. Then he disposed of the chainsaw in the river and went about his life. He moved that freezer on his own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They never did find the freezer. Right. Like. So, and I'm assuming that, well, I guess he wouldn't have had to move the freezer with her in it. He probably could have. Right. Oh, no, no. Pulled her out. She was in the river. But, but, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first trial actually resulted in a hung jury by one person. One jury member could not convict him. I know. What is their name? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they do a second trial, and in November of 1989, so this is three years after Heli disappeared and was seemingly murdered, he was found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. 50? 50! 50. 50. We, are we we're getting close on his release here? <laughs> well, he was 52 year, years old at the time. Okay. I do want to, this is cool too. It was the first murder conviction with no body in Connecticut's history. Oh. Yeah. So that goes to tell you like how different the times were back then in the 80s and how unlikely it is to successfully prosecute a no body case. They're mm -hmm. just really hard. We very, very often do not see justice for families where you cannot find a body. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... In January of 2020, guess who was released from prison? Shut up. Yes. It is on the loose. <laughs> He's on the loose. He's walking around in Connecticut. He lives in a halfway house for veterans in New Haven. And he's 82 years old. So he spent 30 years in prison. Oh, my word. And still claims that he is incident is that he's innocent. But he had nothing to do with it. Watch out, ladies. 
Don't fall for that 82 year old <laughs> pilot, pilot, ex pilot, veteran, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy? I couldn't find any information about the kids, which are adults now at this point, but I don't know who raised them. I don't know if they have communication with him or what. I can't imagine that they do because like he was not a good dad. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, but this is a really sad case. I mean, it's such a story of domestic abuse that she just got stuck in this trap and, and lost herself, I think. And it resulted in murder, sadly. Gosh, man. And oh. Yeah. So the Fargo um, scene if you've seen Fargo, it's the scene where the guy is in the woods and he's feeding this person that he murdered into a wood chipper and the police catch him <laughs> feeding. The, and it's like real gory. I mean, it is. <laughs> and you can just look up that specific scene. You can look up Fargo wood chipper scene. Yeah. So this case is known as the wood chipper murder. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm totally. Yeah. Into it. Yeah. It's not the same storyline. Like it's not his wife that he kills or whatever but like that's how he disposes of the body of the person he does murder is in the wood chipper and whoever and he, the writer whatever of fargo like it was taken from this story essentially like he got the yeah. idea to do that from huh. yes they confirmed that they the inspiration from that scene and um from that murder disposal was from this case so oh so heli lives on <laughs> <Fargo>. <laughs> Gosh, you can <laughs> die in vain. It's <laughs> good cinema, people. Anyway, so there you have it. There's wow. the wood chipper murder. That's that's ugh, that is awful and amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's a real gory. It's a real gross case. No kidding. But but truly, like that, it was amazing that they could find all of the pieces, you know, you, like I said earlier, like you think that would be a good way to dispose of somebody because you're just mm -hmm. like, yeah, like, wow. frozen body in the river, but still little particles of them <laughs> show yeah. up. Well, there was a lot, but I think it truly, like it was a fun case to like learn about because the forensically it was just amazing like all of the ways you put things together I mean you think about these cases from like the 70s and 80s and you're they're frustrating because like I don't even like to do them because you get really frustrated and you're like oh things would be so different now if only they were murdered in 2015 or whatever it would be so different but like they did such a good job and forensic files do you know that show forensic files? yeah we watch it sometimes mm -hmm. okay the pilot episode of forensic files the very first episode that they ever did was on this case Oh, wow. It is episode one, season one, episode one of Forensic Files. So like the launch of their um, show was this case. Hmm. I'm going to have to go watch is, that too now. I because got it was so good. It was so forensically buttoned up. They did such mm -hmm. a good job and they got their conviction. The first one in Connecticut's history with no body, like really, really cool. Yeah, that is cool. It's awesome. Yeah. All right. You got anything else for me? Um, no, but guys, um, our giveaway is still happening right now. You have yeah. until the 10th to yep. follow all of our instructions on so social media. I'm not going to yep. make it easy on you. I'm not going to tell you what they are. You have to go to our social media, <laughs> find out what you have to do to be entered into our giveaway before the 10th. Yes. And you will win something special. Yes. Well, yes. Well, I'm not even going to tell you that now because you know you still have to go to our social media. I mean, yeah. Everybody else knows, so get on it. <laughs> yeah, it started June first and it goes until June tenth. So you got a couple of days to go and enter and get yourself in the running. Yeah. So excited. Yeah. Can't wait to see who wins. I know. Me either. <laughs> but as usual, guys, thanks for listening. Um, when we'd always love to hear hear from you, so please go to our social media. Send us an email, crimesandclosets at gmail.com, Instagram and Facebook. Give us a rating on Apple Podcasts and a yeah. review. Don't just click five stars. I mean, that's awesome. We do appreciate that. But do click five stars. Yes. Click. <laughs> Sorry, I worded that wrong. Click the five stars, <laughs> but also write a little ditty. <laughs> yeah. Tell us why. Tell us why you click those five yeah. stars. Yep. And also always remember the world is scary. People suck. 
hide in your closets. See you, See you next week, guys.